Good morning, family! Hey, listen, you, right there on the couch. Um, you know, I didn't want to say anything, but before we get going on our message today, um, I got to tell you that this is kind of bothering me, and I, I noticed that right after breakfast, you ate that garlic fried rice, and I think you got something really small stuck right there in your teeth. Yeah, right there. It's, it's kind of nasty. Maybe you could take care of that for me. A little distracting. Okay, thanks. Wait, what? Me too? I got something in my teeth too? Nah, you're messing with me for real. Now you're just saying that because what I just said. Listen, my teeth are awesome. Come on, they're glorious. All right. <laughs> now all jokes aside, how annoying was that? Was, was that irritating? Me telling you what you got in your teeth, right? You got something right there. All, all the while my teeth is covered with all kinds of nasty. Now full disclosure, this in my teeth is um, charcoal toothpaste. And so let me rinse it out really quick and then uh, and we'll get back right to it, okay? I don't want to be super distracting. How's that? Let me know in the chat if it's a little bit better. Not, not straighter, but better. <laughs> Thank you so much. Wanted to kind of get, get us kicked off a little bit different today. But, but let me ask you, just as we get rolling, let me ask you, has that ever happened to you before? Where someone out of nowhere corrected or criticized you for something that you did or said. Or, or maybe you've done that. You've done that to somebody that you knew or had relationship with. Because today our message is entitled, You Got Something Right There. <laughs> you got something right. Go ahead and turn, turn to the person near you and tell them, You got something right there. Today, I get to continue our message series entitled, Who is Jesus? And what we've been doing throughout this series is basically we're walking our way through Luke's gospel and asking the question that our faith and our lives are hinged upon, and that's who is Jesus? And our hope as we go through the series is that we would be able to zoom in and get a greater picture and understanding of the life and ministry of Jesus. And so we're going to pick it up from where Pastor Tim brought us last week out of Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, looking at the famous Sermon on the Mount that Jesus brought. And listen, if you missed the message last week, be sure to watch it on our YouTube channel because, man, it was fire, man. It was such a good message. And so be sure to watch that. Now, as I was preparing for this message that I'm bringing today, I was thinking about how very little to no control that we have in our day today, like man, there's so many things that are happening in our world right now. Isn't that true? For example, we, we can't control the craziness of our, our political climate. It, 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 we can't control the virus numbers and the cases that usually dip and go lower and higher. We, ha we, we can't control the, the inconsistency of our economy and how wild that is. Man, there are so many things that are out of our hands. Isn't that true? That we can't control. But what we can do, though, is, is pay attention to our own hearts. What we can do is pay attention to the inputs that are occupying our minds. What we can do is pay attention to the, our own interpersonal relationships and make sure that we don't get lazy there. To make sure that we're loving and compassionate towards the things that we can have influence in. That's where our focus needs to be. Not that those other things weren't important, but, but let's continue to pay attention to the fruit of our own hearts and lives, family. Isn't that, can you say amen to that, fam? Amen. Amen. And that's really what Jesus is getting at here in the scriptures that we looked at last week and what we're going to tackle today. And so if you have your Bibles or your Bible apps, go ahead and pull that out. We're going to be in Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. Luke, chapter 6, starting in verse 37. Now, a little bit of context here. Jesus has just finished telling his disciples not only to love their enemies, but also how to love their enemies by offering mercy and grace to the very people who had treated them so badly. Now, right after that, Jesus speaks to an issue that honestly was pretty radical back then and still is even today. In fact, this issue that Jesus brings up here, we, we've all wrestled with at some point in our lives as, as, as to how to apply it and how to handle it. And so let me phrase it up for us in a question before we get going to Jesus' teachings here. Here's the question, and don't answer too quickly, okay? But here's the question. Is it ever okay to judge? Now, I think that 
many of us don't care for the word judge, right? Like, because it comes with a lot of baggage. Maybe for some of us, it comes with a lot of painful memories of the past. What knee-jerk reaction comes from that question? You know, as I was thinking about this this last week, I was thinking about the, um, that there are a few images that pop into my mind in pop culture that, that um, I think of when I think of the word judgment. And so here's one of them. Uh, maybe this lady here comes to mind for you. Uh, for me, it does. It's Judge Judy, right? And I'm sure she's a very lovely lady, and I, and I don't mean to judge her, right? Bad joke. <laughs> Bad joke. Okay, I'll stop. But, but she's terrifying, right? I mean, I mean, have you ever watched the show? I, I would never try to get something past her, and I don't think you could. Or maybe this image right here comes to mind, the voice, right? Where there's these blind auditions, and if you, you like their voice, they turn their chair. These judges turn their chair. This is my favorite one right here. This is a picture of Simon Cowell. Remember him? American Idol um, and X Factor. I mean, when, if Simon says something good, if he gives his approval, a stamp of approval on the performance, then you know you did something right. But normally he's like, er, right? And there, these are the images. There, there are images. You guys, there are images that, and, um, that nobody wants to be on the other side of, right? So, so we look at that and we go, man, is it ever okay to judge in our lives, just you and I? And many of us would be like, no, it's never okay to judge. And yet at the same time, we have to say, now wait a second, if, if we were to frame it a little bit differently, like has there ever been a time in your life where you witnessed somebody that you love and cared about making poor decisions? And shouldn't you say something? Well, wasn't that kind of like judgment? Well, yes, but no, not really, but kind of. It's complicated, isn't it? If you're a parent or a child of any age, there are going to be times where you're going to need to make a judgment or an assessment of some kind, right? And you're going to have to choose whether you're going to stay silent or to speak up. How about this? Has there ever been a season in your life where you were confused and you were making poor decisions and your life sort of ended up in a ditch, like relationally or financially or spiritually, and nobody has said anything to you? And it's like, doesn't anybody love me enough to speak up, to speak words of, of truth and love? Even though it may not be easy for me to hear, and I definitely need somebody to speak. Now, there are definitely been moments in my life where people who maybe hadn't earned the right to speak into my life spoke and it hurt. And then there's others who earned the right to speak but didn't. And that hurt too. This is a complicated subject, isn't it? And, and we're going to need the wisdom of God to know how to navigate it well. And Jesus gives us this wisdom in Luke chapter 6. Because as it turns out, there are going to be lots of moments in life. And I want you to hear this because this is the heartbeat of our message today. There are going to be mo- many moments in our life where love requires us to say something. Let me say that again. Love requires us to say something. And it's not going to be easy to say, and it's not going to be easy to hear. And we also know that there are going to be some times where love requires us to stay silent and to allow the Spirit of God to do what only He can do. And and so being able to navigate and know the difference between whether to speak or stay silent is something that we're going to have to ask for the wisdom of God and the Holy Spirit to give us. Man, there's a lot at stake, isn't there? And so let's look at the wisdom that only Jesus can give. He starts off in the passage and he says this. He says, almost as if he's appearing to just settle the matter before we get started. He says, do not judge others and you will not be judged. Now, most of the time after reading that scripture, many of us would be like, all right, that's great. Like, don't judge and you will not be judged. That's awesome. But watch this. He's more to say. He says this. He says, do not condemn others or it will all come back against you. Do not condemn others or he will all come back against you. Now, what, is, what I want you to notice here is, is Jesus seems to be making some sort of distinction between judgment and condemnation. That's why he mentions the two in back-to-back statements. And there are moments where it's going to be very difficult not to judge. Just really quickly, how many of us like to, ju- like to be judged? Not, I'm sure none of us are raising our hands. We don't like, none of us like to be judged, right? 
But how many of us judge others? Man, I bet I'm raising my hand here. I know, sure, you're maybe on the couch raising your hand in the kitchen. Like we all, man, we all have judged others, whether it's internally, maybe we, we don't say it, but maybe mentally we sort of judge or, or, or yeah, we all have these moments, right? We, and, and there are going to be moments when we actually need to make appropriate judgments. For example, like if you're a boss and you've got employees and you've got some, to make, you got to make some assessments, man. You got to make some judgments at times. Or if you're a parent and you, you got to, right? Like, like if, if I see a child, if I see my child veering off into a certain direction, I need to speak up. Man, that, there are judgments that we need to make all the time, right? Like there are times we need to do it. And what Jesus is saying here is that there is a difference between making an appropriate assessment of something and condemning someone. Those are very, very different. In fact, let me give you the definition of condemnation. Here it is. Condemnation is coming to hasty conclusions about someone else's actions, motives, and behaviors without make, taking the time to get all the facts. It's a failure to understand where they're coming from or what they're going to through. And listen, in order for us to understand what, where people have come from and where people are, what people are going through, it requires what? It requires a relationship. It requires us to have relationship with them. There are some people who have not earned the right to speak truth into someone's life, not yet. And there are others who have, and Jesus is saying, he's saying that, that what is so damaging to people in relationship isn't that we speak the truth into somebody's life, but we speak in a way that may be abrasive or shaming or maybe even condemning. And Jesus says that if you do that, that eventually it's going to come back to you. But if you can, he continues, he says this, he says, if you can forgive others and you will be forgiven, give and you will receive your gift will be re returned to in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and pouring into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. <laughs> that, that is an awesome word that Jesus has to share there. Now, oftentimes you may, you and I may, maybe you heard this, these verses in context of financial generosity, but really what Jesus is talking about here is interpersonal relationships. And so what is he talking about? He's talking about being pr pressed down, shaken together. What does that mean? Well, recently, um, my wife and I, we bought animal crackers. Our kids love that stuff, man. And they, they love to, to take it to school as a snack during recess. And so in the morning, we, while we're getting ready to get to school, we have them fill up their snack containers for the day. And when, we, when they fill it up, to the brim with animal crackers, what do, what do you think they do? It's full, but what do you think they do? Yeah, yeah, they, 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 they shake it together, they push it down, they try to make room for more. They wanna get as much of that deliciousness as possible. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. He's saying that we, that we you and I, we can give this type of grace in our interpersonal relationships. That's what, will give us, that's what will be given to us. When we give it, that's what will be given to us. He says, it will be chock full, pressed down, shaken together, making room for more. Why? Because we all need it. Can you say amen to that? We all need it. I don't know anybody who is like, man, I could, do, I could use a little less grace in my life. No, no, man, I, I don't know about you, but, but I need as much grace as I can get. And the generosity that we apply in our interpersonal relationships is the same. That we need to. We need to be gracious. We need to bring that grace forward. You see, in verse 39, Jesus gives this illustration and he goes and he says, Can one blind person lead another? Won't they both fall into a ditch? I think that's so funny. Have you ever been in a stubborn kind of relationship? Like, kind of like the blind leading the blind? Neither one of you want to give in. Neither one of you want to give grace or generosity. And so both of you sort of end up in a ditch. And so instead, of, instead, what Jesus says here is he's saying in verse 40, students are not greater than their teacher, 
But students who are fully trained, is fully trained, will become like their teacher. What is he saying here? He's saying that you and I are the students and he is the teacher. And he says that when it comes to our interpersonal relationships, don't try to reflect the attitude that the other person gives you, but be a reflection of who I am to you, is what Jesus says. Jesus was wanting to mean, that's what he means. And then he says in verse 41, where he gets to the heart of this passage, and he says this, And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying, friend, let me help you get rid of the speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite, first get rid of the log in your eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Wow, that was so good. Now, maybe you've heard this passage before, but I want you to just think about it for a minute. I mean, the visual that Jesus shares is so bizarre, isn't it? Because, I mean, let me just ask you this question. Like, when's the last time you had a log in your eye? I mean, literally. I mean, I mean, I mean all of us, I mean, sure, many of us have had maybe a piece of dust in our eye or a sawdust or, or some kind of speck, right? Maybe an allergy or something. And we've all had that, right? It's so annoying. It's microscopic. You, can, you can't see it, but you can feel it. And it's just um, annoying. But none of us, listen, I'm sure none of us have ever had a two by four in our eye. <laughs> and so let me show you what uh, this analogy that Jesus is, is trying to share here. And it's hilarious. He, he, he says this, he says, listen, whenever you've got a board in your eye, kind of like this, don't just walk around up to your friend and go, hey, bro, bro, li listen, I noticed you have a little speck of sawdust in your eye. Because, doesn't this look ridiculous? I mean, isn't that crazy? And this is what he's saying. Is he's saying, if you do that, if you do that, you've lost all credibility. You've lost all credibility. And so what does it mean? Like, what does it mean? Well, oftentimes in our society, in our culture, we sort of use that to say, well, we shouldn't say anything at all, right? Like we use this phrase, who am I to judge? So, so, so why don't you just do you? I mean, you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. You just do you and I'll do me. And that's what will be, you know? But Jesus, what he's saying in these verses, he's, just, he's not saying that here. What is he saying? Well, he goes this, he goes on and he says, first remove the two by four from your head. Because we would all agree that between a two by four and a piece of sawdust, what's the bigger problem? Yeah, it's the two by four, isn't it? And so he's saying, once you remove that from your eye, then you can effectively go to your friend with some credibility and say, hey, you know what? I noticed that, that um, there, there's this little bit of sawdust in your eye and take my word for it because recently I had this board sticking out of my head and it wasn't very much fun. And I removed it and it was painful, but now the quality of my life has improved dramatically and I can actually see much clearer and, and I'd like to help you too before this speck of sawdust turns into, in, into a log like mine. You see, what happens is that uh, this generosity in spirit turns, turns us from this potential hypocrite into a credible friend. And so how do we navigate that? Because maybe for some of us here, there, there's situations in your life where there's some interventions that need to be had. Or, or maybe there are some past conversations that didn't go so well and, and need to be made right. And this gets kind of challenging for some of us, depending upon your personality, because maybe for some of us, you, you're the aggressive type, where you're just kind of type A, where you, d you don't really mind confrontation, or maybe we see things just purely from black and white, and we're just justice driven, and we're like, yeah, I, I've got something to say to you, but we don't really pay attention to the tone or the attitude of our hearts and we end up crushing the other person. Or maybe on the opposite end, maybe for some of us, we're in the other way. We're, we're sort of afraid of confrontation and we're peacemakers. And, and, and so we, we know that we need to say something, but we don't want to say something because what if we, we, they take it wrong and what if the, it damages our relationship and, and so we stay passive in the process and that's really kind of an issue. And so how do we apply this? I mean, how do we apply this? You see, when we 
look at the life and ministry of Jesus, we see that oftentimes what he did is he often spoke words of judgment into the lives of people who should have known better. I mean, like the religious leaders. He, he was actually very direct with them. He might, he, you know, some might, might even say harsh. He called them liars. He called them thieves. Now, why did Jesus get so upset with them? Well, because they were pushing people farther away from him. Then one day, he, he, he comes along to a booth of a tax collector named Matthew, who was also cheating people. But Matthew didn't know God. And Jesus' tone was very different. He said, hey, Matthew, uh, why don't you come and follow me? On another day, he, he comes across the path of a man who was somewhat vertically challenged. His name was Zacchaeus. And he was ripping off people. And, and Jesus said, hey, I'd like to have lunch with you because, man, Zacchaeus, your life could be so much better. You're better than this. And then he started following. Or that one time when he came across a woman at a well who was dying of thirst, not just physically, but relationally and emotionally and spiritually, one broken relationship after another. And Jesus didn't shame her or guilt her. He didn't give her, he, he didn't give her a hard time, but he gave her hope. We see Jesus perfectly applying this principle that he's been laying out here in Luke chapter 6 all throughout his life and ministry. And it's because of this that I want you and I, man, that you and I, we need to remember this and write this down if you could, if you're taking notes, that there is a big difference between making judgments and bringing, being judgmental. Let me say that again. There is a big difference between making judgments, which is what we're all going to do in our interpersonal relationships because love requires it. But there is a big difference between that and being judgmental. You see, being judgmental is writing people off. Being judgmental is enjoying watching other people squirm. Being judgmental is actually saying with your words and your actions that you are beyond hope and the grace of God. You see, being judgmental is demoralizing people. So how do we do this? How do we speak up and into the lives of those around us? Well, primarily what Jesus is most concerned about here is the attitude of our hearts. You see, Jesus judges. The Spirit of God is there partly to bring conviction. And what do you think conviction is? Conviction is a judgment of some kind. It's this assessment of our actions, our behaviors, and our words. Because love requires it. But the way that Jesus judges us is, is with this generosity of spirit, a way out of it, a, a hope for the future. He knows the whole truth about you and I. He knows the whole truth about uh, the extent of our sin. And yet he still reaches out in mercy, granting us forgiveness through his death on the cross and new life through his resurrection. And, and the grace that we give should mirror the grace that has been given so richly to us. It is the grace that we so need. Isn't that true? Can you say amen to that family? And so you see, He is gracious to the gracious. He is generous to the generous. And all of us, before we even speak into anybody's life, first have to ask God to speak into ours. And just ask God, Lord, help me to just do a heart check. We have to recognize that we've all got our own opala, that we've all got our own junk. Isn't that true? And we've got to acknowledge that some stuff that I, that I need is to deal with my own life, is, is to allow the Spirit of God to do spiritual surgery on me. Because to be honest, I'm not in a position of authority over anybody. But you know what? Man, Romans, I love this verse, Romans chapter 14, verse 10, it says this, it says that we will all, all of us will stand before the judgment seat of God. And that statement right there is enough to humble me. Because listen to me, nobody has ever changed by shame. Nobody ever has changed by a guilt trip. I mean, maybe temporarily, but not long term. And what God is after is not just behavior modification in your life. Man, he, God is after real heart transformation. And heart transformation requires two things. It requires truth wrapped in grace. Can you say amen to that? And, and, and to, in my opinion, there is nothing more powerful than that. All truth and no grace, I can't hear you. All grace and no truth, it won't change me. But you actually take these two things together and they have the power to soften the hardest of hearts and turn it around. 
And so it's this balancing act, right? Like this balancing act that admittedly is so hard between being overly accommodating and overly abrasive. And we can't be either one, right? It's not, we got to stay balanced. But actually, if we're going to err, we should err on the side of grace. We should err on the side of grace and let the Spirit of God do what only He can do. And I remember the truth of that came home to me so clearly when I was in college. There was one semester where I was really getting undisciplined. And I'm probably one of the only people that, um, that is watching online right now or online that has ever happened to in college, right? But I, I, I would stay up too late. I would sleep in too long. And, and I wasn't working hard enough. I was slacking off in my schoolwork. And, and really, I, I needed somebody to speak into my life. And there was this one class where I was taking, uh, that I was taking, it was this English composition class. And, and it, I remember there was a test coming up and I wasn't motivated to study for it and I was letting my grades slip and, and I just didn't prepare for it. And I remember I went in and I just kind of winged it, you know, <laughs> and I took the test and, and to nobody's surprise, I bombed badly. Like guys, I bombed so bad. I, I, I say I bombed and I don't mean that I just got an F. I mean that like out of a hundred percent, I got like 32%. And it was really, really bad. And I remember I, I, I was getting the results back and I, and I, you know, I, I was getting, I remember getting a little upset. I got defensive. I knew that, you know, inside, deep inside, I didn't do the work. I, I hadn't prepared myself, but I, I remember thinking, man, I don't deserve a 32%. I mean, I, do I deserve a, a, like a 50% or 45%? Maybe, but, but it's not a 32%. And so I asked the, to meet the professor after class. And I remember meeting with her. And, 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 and um, man, I just remember sitting down across from her. And I just began to complain and whine and, and say all kinds of things. Like, oh, it's too hard. You didn't cover this in class. And what I was trying to do is just pin the blame on her. That's what I was trying to do. But I remember, man... Just her, just sitting across from me, just patiently listening to every word that I was saying. And then she said to me, Jared, thank you so much for coming in and talking to me. You know, uh, and then I remember her standing up and walking be around her desk, taking off her glasses and looking at me. And she said, honestly, I don't think that this test was as hard as you make it out to be. I think you could have exerted a little bit more effort because Jared, you're better than this. And I never forgot those words. She said, she was like this. She said, Jared, you're better. You're a better student than this. You are a better person than this. And then she goes, but however, I, I don't know for sure. Maybe the test was a little bit harder than I would intended it to be. And, and so here's what I'm willing to do. I'm willing to raise your grade and I'm willing to give you a better grade than, than what I think is reflected in your work. And listen, you guys, I remember walking out of the class that day, just stunned. I was stunned. I was just overwhelmed I, that, that I was, that, that's not how I expected the conversation to go. I thought that she might tell me that I could retake the test for maybe half credit at least, or I thought that she would try to just make me feel bad, or I thought she would sh try to shame me. But it turns out that, that she had a whole lot of wisdom. She knew that in that moment, by trying to push me or lean on me or shame me, maybe it would get me to work harder temporarily. But what she was going after was long-term change. And it stuck. And I tell you, it stuck. Because what happened to me after that day is I walked out of there just feeling convicted. Not by her, but by the Spirit of God. I remember thinking to myself, man, I don't deserve this. Man, this, is, this is, wow, this is crazy. But it made me want to be better. And that's what grace does. That's what grace, sometimes the Holy Spirit wants to speak through you to the lives of others, but the Holy Spirit doesn't want you to be judge and jury. You, you've got to allow the God to do what only He can do. And grace is more powerful, a more powerful motivator than what shame ever will be. Now, once again, the, don't misapply this, right? Does, it, does this mean that every single time she'll raise my grade? No, no, like she, she didn't, I, believe me, she didn't. I mean, like next time around, not necessarily the same deal. But it is to say there is nothing more powerful than grace. And God knows that. And there is nothing more powerful than a group of imperfect people coming shoulder to shoulder with one another and simply saying, man, I've been there too. I love those words. 
I mean, they are so powerful when you are talking to somebody who may be struggling or going through challenges. And so I want to just encourage you, here's your four Monday as we get ready to conclude, is whenever somebody shares, man, a struggle or a challenge with you this week, um, I want to encourage you to use these powerful words here. And it's just this, these words, I have to, I have to. Like they might come up to you and say, man, man, I really, really am going through a hard time. And you know what, man, I, I have to. And I'm really struggling with this addiction right now. Hey, I'm so glad that you shared that with me. I have to. You know, I, I, I let my anger get the best of me. I, I totally get it, man. I have to. You, you know what that's called? This is called identification. This is called attunement. It's called empathy. And there is something more po so powerful about that. It, it's a common human experience. But we don't just go, oh, it's okay. You, you just kind of continue to do you. No, we actually challenge each other to say, man, you know what? You know what? Like there's a better way. We don't have to stay in this rut. We don't have to stay in this dish. We can actually come out of it together. And we serve a God who doesn't just juggle, you know, judge us at a distance. We serve a God who is willing to come close. You know, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says this. It says, we, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And I love that verse. See, God is the only one who has the power and the position to judge anyone. But instead, He sent His Son to become our judgment. So we can offer that same kind of mercy and grace to one another. And we have to ask ourselves, if we don't, man, does the Holy Spirit really reside in me? You know, like one of the most common objectives, and you know this, is one of the most common objectives of people to not coming to church, and I hear it all the time, is, is this, is, well, I'll be judged there. I mean, I mean, Christians are judgmental. And you know what? At times, we can be. I mean, they, they kind of have a point. And I think what we need to do is not go to the other side of just being overly accommodating to everything, but we just need to come back to the gospel center to keep these two things in balance of truth and grace, to recognize that this is a place for everyone without shame. Can I say that again? That this is a place for everyone without shame. You should never feel shamed. You should never feel pinned down, by your, pinned down to the ground by your past. There is a way forward. God is for you and not against you. God can see a better way. That's why Jesus went to the cross. And without that, none of us would have the sword of hope. If God can't save everyone through His grace, then He can't save anyone. Isaiah, he, I love how he puts it. He puts it so well in chapter 53, verse 6. He says it this way. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on Him the sins of all of us. I love that. So I want you to know what kind of church that you're a part of and, and that you're watch, you've joined online today. Man, we... Our heart is we will, we will offer a hand of help, not a finger of condemnation. We want to be a group of people that offer a hand of help and compassion, not a finger of condemnation. You see, family, the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We all are going to be, you know, come into this place. We're all going to love people right where they are and offer grace. Why? Because that's what we've been given and that's what is just con is continuing for us to be needed. You know, like we need that. We need grace. And we're going to offer mercy and forgiveness because all of those things are what transformation is made of. Transformation is for everyone. See, there is, are, are not just degrees of sin. There are just plain old sin. And so regardless of your past, regardless of your mistakes and and, and, and that you've made or regardless of the divorce or regardless of, of the, uh, the addiction or regardless of the bankruptcy, regardless of your anger issues, there may be consequences to your behavior, but God says you can still have a future. You can still be redeemed by my grace. There is a better way. And today, if you have, re have never responded to that grace, man, I'd love to introduce you to Jesus. 
I'd love to, for you to place your trust in Him right now to reach out and claim what He died for you to have. And not just for you, but for the people that you know and you love as well. Because, man, that is the only way. Can you say amen to that family? Would you pray with me? Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you for just your grace and your love. Lord, that when, when you call us to judge others, you call us to judge others with a, a, a sense of, Lord, just compassion. The compassion and the grace and the mercy that you're so generous with uh, what, us with. And so, Lord, help us to see it see them the way that you see them see people from your perspective and your prerogative lord and father i just thank you so much that you are the one that models what judgment looks like you're the one that models what empathy looks like lord god and so father i just want to pray for those that have maybe never received you as their lord and savior has never said man i want to follow you god Lord, I pray that today they would come under this place of wanting to do that. And so family, if you've never invited Jesus to um, come in and dwell in your life, if you've never said man, yes to him and wanted to follow him for your life, I wanna just um, invite you to pray this with me. Would you just pray after me these words? Father God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for loving and accepting me right where I'm at. Lord, please forgive me. For I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Lord, I, please fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I might follow you all the days of my life. And I say all of this out loud so that everyone can hear me. I say this for, so that heaven can hear and even hell that Jesus Christ, you're my Lord and my Savior and my King. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.